Hello, good morning, family of grace. Welcome to our online campus. I'm so glad you're worshiping with us here today. Hey, if you're new here, I wanted to let you know, in case you didn't know, we're a multi-campus church on the central coast of California. We have a slow campus, a five cities campus, and a North County campus, and we would love to see you at any of those physical campuses. But I'm really glad you're here today worshiping online. Maybe you're checking us out for the first time. Maybe the, this is the campus that you're at all the time. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're traveling. For whatever reason you find yourself here, welcome. I'm really glad you're here worshiping today. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm the online campus pastor here at Grace Central Coast. And we're going to start our time off like we normally do at all of our campuses. We're going to read from God's Word. We're going to reorient our heart posture to one of response to the Lord. And we're going to respond to him in worship. So let's read together from the Psalms, from Psalm 42, and then we're going to sing out with our slow campus band from last week. It says this in Psalm 42. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's sing out to our hope in our God now. Lord, we come, Lord, to glorify you in our hearts and our minds. This time, Lord, is for you. We thank you, Lord, that you have opened our eyes to see you. You have revealed yourself to us. And Lord, we just pray and we thank you, God, for just continuing to take us deeper, Lord, into who you are, how you made the world to be, Lord, and how you're working. Lord, we love you and we need you. We praise you. Amen. Arise, my soul, arise, my soul, remember this, he took my
this for your glory. All of this for your glory. Well, hey, family of grace. My name is Jess Jantos. I'm the women's care director here, and it's an honor to be worshiping online with you today. We're now going to be entering into our time of the service that we call Giving Back. This is a way that we worship God through the giving of our finances. If you're new and just checking out our church, we're not asking you to give. We're just super glad that you're here. We hope you get to learn a little bit more about what we do here at Grace Central Coast. But if you consider Grace to be your church home, you know that there's always um, two easy ways you can give. You can do that digitally or physically. And as always, we like to remind you what your finances goes towards. There's always a lot going on here at the life of our church. Today, I want to tell you about a really exciting opportunity that we have to serve our community in a really unique way, and that's through our blood drive. So coming up in August, we're going to be having blood drives at each of our three physical campuses. And this is a way, if you're willing and able to give um, back to our community, there are so many people that need blood. Um, summer is a time of a, low, of a blood shortage. Shortage, and it is really critical right now. And so we're looking to really um, bless our community in this way. Your blood donation, one donation can actually save up to three lives. And this goes to local patients here at hospitals. Um, and so it is really needed and used. Something that I really love um, when I give blood is that I receive a text usually about a week later telling me that my donation was used. And I take that moment to stop and pray for whoever it is that was receiving my blood at that time. So I just really encourage you. I hope you can do this. Um, there's going to be a QR code. You can sign up to donate at each of our um, campuses. And really, let's just use this as a way to bless those in our medical community who are in need of this. And so, um, yeah, as we think about this and we head into our next part of service, would you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you for this really tangible way to serve and love those in our community who are medically fragile. Um, we pray for our doctors and our nurses who are caring for these patients. We pray for people who are going to be receiving this blood that we give here in a few weeks. Lord, we just pray that they would um, know how loved they are and cared for, not only by um, those of us here in our church community who gave, but also by you, Lord. And so would you just, um, would you just help us be a blessing to our community in this way. We pray for the rest of our service. We thank you for Pastor Darren and him opening his wor your word today, Lord, and we just pray that you would speak through him as we hear more about um, how your gospel impacts so much of our lives, every part of our life, Lord. So we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time to gather together, even online. We thank you for those who are tuning in right now. Would you bless them today? In your name we pray. Amen. All right, our scripture reading today is going to be in Genesis. Um, so turn to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 31. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've been saying this summer that the gospel of Jesus affects real life. And for the last couple of weeks, we've started to see how the gospel changes the way we view and do our work, our jobs. But can it really do that? Or does the gospel, if we're honest, basically stay within the church building and our time at work really has nothing to do with Jesus? To help us here, let's imagine for a moment a Christian architect. What makes an architect who believes the gospel different from one who doesn't? Or is the only difference what one of them believes and where she spends her Sunday mornings? 
Amy Sherman in her book on Christian work, Kingdom Calling, explains that there are four main approaches that could be taken here. The first is this, you should be a really good architect. You should make innovative and beautiful designs that people love if you're a Christian architect because you know work is a gift from God. So you work really hard and value excellence because you know you're working for the Lord and not for men. But if we're honest, that's not enough because plenty of non-Christian architects are also doing great work. So a second approach is to be moral or bring your Christian values into the workplace. So as an architect, you don't lie to or cheat your clients. You obey industry regulations and treat your employees fairly and don't say anything inappropriate in the office. But that doesn't quite cut it either because the same could be said for the Mormon architect across town or the agnostic one in your own office who just has a sense of right and wrong. So a third approach is to go further and be evangelistic as an architect, to offer Bible study before work for your employees, open team meetings with prayer, put an probably out of context Bible verse on your website talking about what you do, or maybe more seriously, sharing about Christ with clients or inviting employees to church. And now we're getting somewhere. But Amy Sherman says there's one more step we can take to really see how our relationship with God could affect our work as an architect. And that would be to integrate faith and work, to see the work itself as relating to and reflecting God, finding that link between what you're doing with your hands and your mind and what God did in his work of creating the world which in the case of an architect is not that hard to do because on the first pages of the Bible story, what do we see God doing? We see him using his knowledge and power to design and build a world for humans to inhabit. He is the first architect. And this type of integrating of faith and work can apply to all work. And when we work like that, our work becomes worship. I know that some of you love the gospel. You love Christ and the church and worship. But if you're honest, you feel like during work, you have to leave that world behind Monday through Friday. But what if that could change? What if every day could be worship to Jesus? I want to submit to you today that it can be and it should be. And I want to try to help us see how by talking about today, the gospel and your work as culture making. The gospel and your work as culture making. You may be saying when you hear that phrase, what exactly does that even mean? And you're not alone in that because that's exactly what I said when I sat in Pastor Tim's office a couple months ago and he told me, I want you to take the work, the week on work as culture making. So I'm not going to lie, in a series that has been so practical and on the ground in many ways, the gospel for real life, today is going to be a little theological, philosophical, theoretical, a little heady, but I'm also convinced from my study and thinking about this, that any of us who work at home, in the office, on a farm, at a job site, will be able to see by the end of today what this idea of culture making has to do with God, the good news of Jesus, and how we show up to our jobs tomorrow. So grab an outline, a pen, and a Bible. Turn to Genesis chapter one if you're not already there as we begin this exploration. And before we dive in, I just wanna highlight a few resources that I used as I was studying for this that you may find helpful if you wanna dive deeper. One is Andy Crouch's Culture Making. Another was referenced by Pastor Tim as well, but Timothy Keller's Every Good Endeavor, and then Amy Sherman's Kingdom Calling that I just mentioned. Also, if you're new to our church, welcome. We're so glad you're here today. My name is Darren Nelson. I serve at our Slow Campus as the College and Young Adults Pastor and excited to talk about work as culture making today. So let's begin by looking at the calling of culture making the calling of culture making. And we'll do that in Genesis 1, but before we even get there, I think it's helpful to try to define what we mean by culture. Turns out, culture is one of the hardest words to define in the English language, but this is what you'll find if you look at Webster's definition. Culture is the customary beliefs, social forms, and material traits of a racial, religious, or social group. 
or you might find something like this, that culture encompasses religion, food, what we wear and how we wear it, our language, marriages, music, etc. So cultures are made up of tangible and intangible things. And what we find in the Bible is that God created humans with the capacity and the command to build these things, to cultivate what he created into new things that take our world forward. So you could think about it this way. God made waves, but we made surfing. God made sound and we made music. So let's look together at Genesis chapter one, the first page of the Bible, to see what God says about this idea of culture making in our work. So Genesis one and two is the story of God creating a good world and humans to inhabit that world. He creates and he cultivates. And then interestingly enough, he instructs the humans to do the same thing. This passage at the end of chapter one has often been called the cultural mandate, the mandate from God to make and sustain culture for humanity. So let's look again, starting in verse 26 of chapter one. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So a few brief observations. That phrase, let us make man in our image is so key. It's mentioned three times in this short passage that we are made in the image of God, to reflect God, to be like him and do some of the things that he does as his image bearers on earth. We are to reflect or image God. Second, a phrase that's in there twice is we're told to have dominion, dominion over the earth. We are rulers for God on his good earth. And then we see this command in verse 28 to be fruitful and multiply. The humans are supposed to make more humans and go out and spread across the earth. And then he says to subdue it. Tim Keller in his book, Every Good Endeavor says, the word subdue here indicates that even in its original form, God made the world to need work. This is fascinating that work is in paradise before there's sin. Adam and Eve are being called here to cultivate and create from what God has given them. We see this even more specifically and clearly if you look over in chapter two, we get a kind of zoomed in version of the creation story. And starting in verse 15 of chapter two, look at this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Look at this, to work it and keep it. Adam is a gardener. That is his job. His job is to work and keep the garden. And Keller makes the argument from here that this is really an archetype for all work. That all work, if you think about it deeply enough, is very much like gardening. Right? Gardening is taking the raw materials of the earth and ordering them in a way that brings forth new things like food and flowers. And Keller says all work is like that. So let's think about a few examples. I mean, what is a baker doing? They're combining raw ingredients of yeast and flour and heat and time in a specific combination to bring about a nourishing and delicious loaf of bread that didn't exist before. What is a parent doing? They're taking this raw child that comes from the womb with incredible potential, but incredible dependency. And over the course of years and decades, cultivates them through teaching and adventures and meals and discipline, cultivates them into someone beautiful who will reflect God's glory in this world. Or how about even a financial advisor? What are they doing? They're taking people and money and expertise and combining them to craft a better future for individuals or families or companies. They are, in a sense, gardening. In each case, you have people taking what already exists, 
whether raw materials of the earth or things created by others before them and making something new and beautiful to benefit others. But the calling is not just to cultivate, but to create. We see this in Adam and his archetypal work as well. If you look over at verse 19 of chapter two, a very famous portion of the creation story, something very interesting happens in verse 19. It says, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. This is so interesting because surely God could have named the animals and told Adam. He knows these creatures inside and out. He made and sustains them. But here, what do we have? We have God himself sitting back, waiting, watching what Adam will do. And here's what we're seeing. God's design for humanity involves work And it involves work where we create and cultivate out of what God has already made for us. We get to take what God gives and come up with ways to use those materials in a way that reflects his own creativity and blesses the people he's created. We are called, in short, to make cultures. So God's plan for humanity is not just to find out you're a sinner and trust in Jesus to save you and then wait to die so you can go to heaven. No, he seems here to care about work and culture because he commands the first humans to take what he has created and make something out of it. Andy Crouch in his fascinating and sometimes a little too deep for me book, Culture Making, says it this way. Whenever you see image bearers doing what they were made to do, this is what they're doing. Taking the good raw materials of the world God made and saying, how can I cultivate this? How can I create with this? What possibilities are lying in there waiting to be explored? So this is the calling of culture making. But now let's look at the value of culture making. Why is this so valuable? Well, first, back in Genesis chapter one, if you notice again, the ruling and the dominion and the subduing and the fruitfulness and the multiplying, all of it is stemming out of this idea that we are images of God. And so this idea of the value of culture making is first, it's valuable because it images God if we can use the word images as a verb, that we're doing something where we're reflecting God in doing this type of work because it's what we were made to do, right? God in Genesis 1 is calling the humans to do what he did. This is fascinating that when God makes the world in Genesis 1, it looks very much like what he calls Adam and Eve to do. He's filling and subduing. I mean, when he first starts, he creates basically a blob And then he forms and shapes it and fills it and subdues it. And then those are the words he gives to the humans. He says, fill the earth and subdue it. So it images God, it reflects God when we don't just work for a paycheck or show up to do a task, but we think of and engage in our work as culture making. It images God. Second, it loves neighbor. Right, it gives them chairs to sit on, bread to eat, trails to hike, medicine to take. This is God's design that our work would bless those around us, believer or unbeliever. It's so interesting to me that in Israel's story, when they go into what we call the exile or basically a 70 year timeout because of their sin, here's what God instructs them to do. Jeremiah 29, seven says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. A sinful, evil, wicked city, by the way. And to pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. He's calling his people to use the gifts and skills and opportunities he will give them, including their work, to improve the city. And he's calling us to do the same, which is such a challenge for us today in a a culture that so often seems evil and opposed to God and opposed to the gospel. 
And I think Andy Crouch is very helpful here in his book when he talks about what he calls postures or gestures toward the culture at large. And he says, there's four basic ways we can approach culture as Christians. One is condemning culture. Just saying, that's evil, that's wicked, we're going nowhere near that. Second is to critique culture. Critiquing culture is writing articles, having discussions, making documentaries, creating things where we assess and critique what's good and wicked about the culture. A third option is copying culture, where we kind of just take what the culture does well and make a Christianized version of their music or their clothes, which if we're honest, usually ends up being a not as good version of whatever the world's doing. And a fourth option is consuming culture, which I'm afraid is one of the most common nowadays for Christians along with condemning culture, is just simply to always say, I'll just take whatever the culture gives. I'll just consume that movie and those shows and wear those clothes and I'll just do whatever they do regardless of what kind of sin it leads me into. And each of these are needed gestures temporarily, Crouch says, but they are poor postures to take permanently. So at times we should condemn or critique or copy or even consume, but permanently, his point is rather Christians who want to transform the culture can best do so by creating culture, by making new things as an alternative. Andy Crouch calls it expanding the horizons of the possible. So whether you are reattaching a bumper to a car or teaching your child or investing millions of dollars or counseling someone or developing software, you are, if you think about it, expanding the horizons of what's possible for the people you're serving. So it's loving our neighbors to do this. A third value of creating culture is it brings truth, goodness, and beauty. It brings truth, goodness, and beauty into our world. Tim Keller's definition of work is this. Work is rearranging the raw material of God's creation in such a way that it helps the world in general and people in particular thrive and flourish. He says it's partnering with God in his love and care for the world. So to borrow biblical phrasing, we could say, the egg is good, the omelet is very good. The coffee bean is good, but an iced mocha from Banner is very good. Sound is good. Claire de Lune is very good. And this is the way, interestingly enough, that God wanted it for us to be the ones to figure stuff out and subdue the earth. And I think coffee is such a great example of this. I've been getting more into coffee over the last year, I've become you know, a real coffee drinker, drinking it black, like many of you. And I don't understand a ton yet about all that goes on with coffee, but my best understanding is that the process goes something like this. There's actually fruit trees in certain parts of the world that have a fruit on them. You can take the fruit off, open it up, and inside the fruit is a seed, which is what we would call a coffee bean. And that bean can then be roasted or cooked and then ground up. And then someone at one point was saying, hey, let's do all this. And then we'll pour hot water over it. And then it will create this delicious drink that gives us energy. And what I love to imagine is the Trinity waiting for us to figure this out. Right? Like God creates the tree that has the seed that can do all of that. And he knows And there's all this latent potential there and he's just waiting to see what we're gonna do with it. Like how long was God waiting for us to figure out the coffee thing? And I just like, finally someone pours that first cup of coffee and I imagine God seeing that and saying, that's very good. And then I imagine probably the spirit says to Jesus, now just wait for them to figure out espresso. And here we are centuries later with all kinds of things stemming out of just this one cultural good, coffee. So this may sound to some of us interesting, inspiring, but the reality of all of this is creating culture, making culture is very difficult. Work itself is very difficult. So let's look at for a few minutes the difficulty of culture making. And I wanna go to Genesis chapter three 
If you'll turn there with me, if you know the story of the Bible, you know why we're turning here to talk about the difficulty of work and culture making because it all goes wrong in Genesis 3. So the man and the woman decide to not trust God. They do things their way instead of God's way. They break the relationship and here's the curse that is given out. Start in verse 16 with me. Genesis chapter three, verse 16. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. So part of a woman's work in this world is she can actually bring about human beings. She can bear children. And God says, that's actually gonna be harder for you now. And then verse 17, and to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. till you return to the ground for out of it, you were taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You see these phrases about the difficulty of work? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it. Thorns and thistles, the sweat of your face. This means work is now going to be hard. It's going to be tedious and frustrating. And don't you find this to be true? I mean, even for those of us who love the work we get to do, we have to do things in our jobs we don't like. Our work is never as good as we want it to be. It's never finished. Everything is a rough draft. And there's so many factors limiting us, working against us in our visions and hopes for our work. But it's not just that work is cursed. It's that we are cursed. Because of our connection to Adam, we have all sinned. We all have sin in our hearts and minds and we bring our sin into our work. So often we turn work from culture making into identity making, seeking self-worth and power and making something of ourselves, glorifying ourselves. This is where the story leads in Genesis chapter 11 as this new hot technology, the brick, real fancy at the time, comes into play. We read this in Genesis chapter 11. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed, which was God's design, fill the earth over the face of the whole earth. This is humanity saying we can reach heaven. We can be gods. We can glorify ourselves. And we're all susceptible to this in our work. So work is difficult because of the curse on work and because of our own sin. And how does the gospel speak into this? It does so because Christ and the gospel can save us from this difficulty. When Jesus dies on the cross, he cries out, it is finished. Because on the cross, Christ finished the ultimate work of salvation, of bringing sinners back to God. And this means two things for your work. First, it means you can be forgiven for all the ways you distort your work. All of your idolatry and selfishness and unkindness and jealousy in your work was paid for at the cross. You can be forgiven because of Christ's finished work. And second, this means that you can rest in whatever you have been able to complete. Because if you died tomorrow and all you ever accomplished is what you've already done, as unsatisfied as you might be, it would be enough. Because God will not love you more if you get more done. Other people will, but he won't. You will be no more worthy in God's eyes. He loves you because you're in Christ and Christ's work is finished. And this can free us from the depression that can set in with the difficulties of work and culture making. And the finished work of Christ means a third thing because in his resurrection, Jesus previews for us a new world where all our efforts at work will take on a new existence. 
because we are headed for an eternity of culture making. An eternity of culture making. Turn with me to the end of the Bible story. Revelation chapter 21. We've seen the beginning of the Bible story and what it says about culture and work. Now let's go to the end of the story and see where this is all heading in God's good plan. Revelation chapter 21 what we see here is that the Bible story ends not with the eradication of culture, but the redemption and resurrection and perfection of culture, recreation, not just a garden, but a city, a place full of people and culture. Look with me, chapter 21, starting in verse one, we read, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw, look at this, the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Man, just those two verses could correct so many misconceptions of heaven that are in the church. I mean, I grew up in the church. I think I genuinely thought heaven was some sort of immaterial place where our souls continued on and we kind of floated around on clouds, basically one long worship service. That is not what the Bible just described. It says a new heavens and a new earth, a holy city, new Jerusalem coming down And it says, this is a city. This city, that means it will be filled with culture, right? In the resurrection, we know that we will have tangible glorified bodies and we will live in a tangible physical world, a city. The first city ever, imagine this, to exist solely for the glory of God. It is the opposite of Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel, a different type of city. I spent some time with my family this summer up in the city of Portland, Oregon, visiting some other family. And man, like any city, Portland is full of culture. You go around the city, walking, driving, riding a bike, and everywhere you look, it's just restaurants and food trucks, parks and playgrounds, bridges and bike paths, businesses, hospitals, gardens, churches, neighborhoods. It just feels like endless culture. But the problem with that city or any small town or anything in between is sin. But what we have here in Revelation 21 is a new type of city, a Christ-centered city. Look with me back in chapter 21. Look over at verse 22. As John's vision continues, he says, I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. And now we read something extremely interesting in verse 24. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. What? The kings of the earth will bring their glory into into the new Jerusalem, the holy city? It says it again in verse 26. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. What is this saying? Well, the biblical commentator Michael Wilcox speaks for a host of biblical commentators when he says this. It means that all that is truly good and beautiful in this world will reappear there, purified and enhanced in the perfect setting its maker intended for it. Nothing of real value is lost. It seems in the new Jerusalem, God will plunder the Egyptians, taking the best of all his image bearers have ever made on this earth and perfecting it into all it was meant to be which many theologians have suggested means that all we work for in this world but can never fully get right, that project you're engaged in right now that just isn't going to be all that you wish it could be, it means that one day in new creation, those things may surprise us when we turn a corner and see them come to their full fulfillment in God's redeemed city. 
so that no efforts in our work were ever wasted. So eternity won't be some ghostly existence. It'll be a physical life in God's glorious city. Andy Crouch, one more time, says, our eternal life in God's created world will be the fulfillment of what God originally asked us to do, cultivating and creating in full and lasting relationship with our creator. This time, of course, we will not just be tending a garden, we will be sustaining the life of a city, a harmonious human society that has developed all the potentialities hidden in the original creation to their fullest. Culture, he says, redeemed, transformed, and permeated by the presence of God will be the activity of eternity. If that's too wordy for you, I think what he's basically saying is we'll still do stuff. We'll still make stuff, but we'll do it completely as worship to God. And the invitation is to start this work now. To go back to work this week, seeing your parenting and your farming and your coding and your investing as this type of culture making work. So let's end by briefly talking about moving toward culture making. A couple practical steps to lean into this in our work, as Pastor Tim called it, our work work at our jobs and our life work in every other realm of our days. A couple ideas for how we can do this. First, I want to encourage us to make new efforts to create and cultivate. That might mean grabbing a couple people and a dream to create something new, to glorify God and help people in a local context, to take what already exists around you and cultivate it into something that expands what's possible for those around you. A couple ways I've been thinking about this. One is cultivating my son specifically as a three-year-old now who we have such a relationship and communication together even more than with my one-year-old daughter is I don't want to just be a dad that's present and there at dinners and you know puts him down for bed but I want to think about my relationship with him as cultivating him. This gift that God has given me that God created. How can I cultivate him into all that is in him? All the potential inside him that God has made to make him into someone who can glorify God and bless other people in the world. Another thing I've been thinking about is a a new group that me and a friend are starting for guys who are husbands and fathers and leaders. And we want to get together regularly now to grow in our skills and abilities and accountability in these areas for the sake of the flourishing of those around us. And in both cases, really what's happening is we're doing what Andy Crouch talks about. We're trying to move the horizons of the possible. So you could create or cultivate something new. Second, I want to encourage all of us to view your work, whatever that work is, as culture making. I want you to see my work has dignity and value regardless of my paycheck or my status or what people think of my job when I tell them what I do. My work is a reflection of God and his work in the world and what he did in creation. My work can be seen not just as a task that makes me money so I can live, but a way that I glorify God with my abilities and opportunities and I help serve other people and make new things possible for them. So our hope is that when our life and work are done, is that in our own sin-stained way, we would be able to say with Jesus, the words of John 17, 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And so tomorrow we will go to work at our jobs and in our homes And through prayer and the power of God's spirit, we will do all we can to cultivate our little corners of this world, to take what God has given us and use it for his glory. Because all work done rightly is worship.
we will strive to make something of the world and to make much of Jesus while doing it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for being such a creative God. We thank you for the world you created and for creating us in your image to reflect you in our own work. Lord, we thank you that in all the difficulties and frustrations of work, ultimately our work doesn't give us value. Our work doesn't earn us favor with you. You've given us those things in Christ. But now by his spirit and being made in your image, you've given us the ability and the command to go out and to culture make in our work, to think of our work as something valuable to those around us and something that glorifies you. Would you take us there, Lord? There's so much more to think about and discuss and implement from this. Would you make our church a church full of people who are doing this type of work in the world and seeing our work this way as so much more than a paycheck or a task, but a way that we worship you and love those around us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, thank you so much, Pastor Darren, for bringing us God's Word today. And before we head out, we have just one thing. I want to remind you, next week is our Real Grace series. We're back in Real Grace, and we're going to be checking out Gospel Shadows in the movie Wonka. And so I want to encourage you, if you have time this week, to check out the movie in preparation for next week's message. And we'll see how the story of Wonka mirrors God's story in the Bible. It's going to be a good one. All right, with that, let's go uh, out into the world, reading with and to each other from God's word. It says this in Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Have a great week, church.